That's right. Even you can survive. What's up, everybody? Quicksilver Bandit here, and in today's video, we're talking about how you can survive Terraria's hardest, unmodded difficulty settings as an average gamer with a 9-to-5 job. So let's get right into it. Terraria is hard. And since we're covering hardcore mode, you should be aware that even with this method, you'll probably die a few times getting used to how things work. Don't worry about that, though. Nobody's going to be perfect at this right off the bat. The thing to remember is that there are four pillars to how this method works, and as long as you set yourself up on these four pillars, you're going to have a lot of fun playing the game, and you're also going to get to enjoy all the rewards of success in hardcore expert mode. So what are these four pillars? The first of the four pillars is the metagame. The metagame includes some tricks and exploits that don't modify the fundamental game, but still provide you a substantial advantage. The second of the four pillars is working with your gear. This includes armor, weapons, accessories, etc. The third pillar involves tips and tricks on base building, and the fourth pillar is how to fight bosses. So like I said, the first pillar is the metagame. Let's talk about that in some more detail. The first part of the metagame that will give you a significant advantage in your new world is enabling Halloween mode. This can be done by changing the date on your computer, or by using an external piece of software called Run As Date. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Halloween mode gives you significant advantages in the early game because pumpkins spawn naturally on world generation. Pumpkins are essential because they allow you to craft a set of armor that you would otherwise spend hours trying to equal with other materials. They can also be used to craft pumpkin pies. Pies give you one of the best long-term buffs in the game. The next important thing to talk about in the metagame is the escape key. Yes, the physical escape key on your keyboard is one of your greatest assets to survival. It's definitely a bit cheesy, but if you don't have a whole lot of time to game and you want to experience the rush of hardcore mode, it's indispensable. When you bring up the menu using the escape key and then select save and quit, you will automatically respawn at your world spawn point when you rejoin that world. This also leaves the game in a clean state, meaning there are no enemies immediately spawned into the world, and the player will also no longer have any negative status effects applied to them. So if you've been poisoned in the jungle and you find you're running low on HP, you can escape and return to base safely. The third point in the metagame is something that might seem obvious, but it's really helpful. You can use multiple worlds in Terraria. This isn't Minecraft. Your worlds don't keep separate inventories. This means if you don't have some resource that you need to accomplish a goal in a world where you started playing, you can go to a different world to get it. This can also be combined with world seeds to give you an extra edge. Seeds, just like in many other procedural sandbox games, give you the exact same world in a consistent way. However, they aren't enabled by default in Terraria. You'll need to edit a file named config.json to enable them. This is really easy to do, and I'll leave a link to the wiki page describing how to do so in the description. The final point to consider in the metagame is something you're surely going to run into if you've played Terraria for a long time. Hoiks. Strange name, but they are genuinely awesome. Hoiks are an artifact of the mechanics of the game dealing with movement when sprites overlap. It's a pretty technical aspect of the game, but don't worry. The hoiks we're using in this guide aren't at all complicated. If you like technical things, though, and you want to know more about hoiks, I'll leave a link to the forum post in the description. Any sources of light at all. And you're going to want as much as possible to try to... Ah, see, here we go. We want some sunflowers as quickly as possible, for sure. Now, when you're away from your base area, the rule of thumb is to leave the sunflower that is furthest from your base standing. That way you still get the buff, and it's going to be as far away from the base as possible, so you won't ever risk coming into a conflict with what's in your base. And I know it's a little dark right now, guys. Give me a moment. So, 
at the beginning of the game here, you have a pretty limited number of torches. And things can get dicey real quick, real fast, real quick down here. But sometimes it's worth it to try to put something together. rather painful, but it pays off pretty quick. You get a life crystal out of the deal. Just remember that the maximum fall height before you take damage is going to be 25 blocks. And the f this will give us a good way to see... Uh-huh see some wires and these look like yep those are diamonds awesome ah there we go get some health back so I've only got six torches and that does make this a little difficult okay I can see that there's something I could land on down there so I'm gonna go for it I'm not too worried about it. That was less than 25 blocks. Okay. I do not want to mess with ice bats. Those will quickly be the end of my life. So it's time to run. And again, I'm just using the escape key. It gets me back home. It gets me quickly to my base area. Oh good, there's some more pumpkins growing. That's excellent. I'm going to continue clearing all of this wood out of here for now. And all I'm doing right now, really, is I'm setting myself up a home base. Just a world that I can go to, keep some of my stuff. I know I'll always be safe here as soon as I spawn in, that sort of thing. That way, if I decide for whatever reason that I'm getting in a tricky situation on another world, and I don't feel like even going back to the spawn point of that other world is really going to help me, check that out. Looks like a keg, and... What else? I can't really see. Okay, there is a chest here. Some lead bars, a recall potion. Really not that much, honestly. But having a keg is nice right off the bat. I guess. I probably don't want to mess with him, though. Alright, back to the home world. I think it's about time I actually started building walls. So I'm actually going to take the lead here. And my typical... My typical box is going to be fairly wide. I could have it just a small 3x3 three three or whatever, but... Uh, I kind of like having some extra room. You'll see I got a pumpkin growing here. That's pretty awesome. And also, uh, I like to have room for all of my crafting stations. So, I'm going to go ahead. Since the pumpkin is right there, I'm not going to disturb that. But I'm going to go ahead and I want to build myself a hammer. And this is where hoiks come into the situation. As far as this guide is concerned, hoiks are most useful as part of base building, which is the second pillar we want to look at in a bit of detail. So the basic method of creating a hoik is to set up a sloped tile in a specific configuration using a hammer. For base building, we're using this to make a secure exit from the base. 
and all you need are some wooden platforms and of course a hammer. This will allow you to construct an invincible bunker out of your base. A place where you will be able to safely destroy monsters, but they won't be able to touch you because from their perspective, the base has completely solid walls. Once you have an invincible bunker built, you'll want to set up your base layout. There are tons of different strategies out there. You can build a super fancy house, or everything might be like mine, just a couple of dirt rooms with some basic wooden furniture. You may want a separate room in which to craft, or you may want to put all of your crafting stations close together in your invincible bunker, like I have. The important thing to consider is the power of NPCs to control random spawns in the area, as well as their ability to assist you in battle. I've opted for a horizontal, underground setup for a couple of reasons. The first is that spreading out NPCs like this gives me a wide area where no monsters will spawn around my base. This is great for ensuring I have lots of room for building farms later, and it will become critical once I move the world into hard mode. Next, let's talk about the gear you're going to want to have to make sure you're able to survive. There are a couple of important pieces of gear you simply won't survive long without. The most important of those is a fall stopper of some kind. These include things in bottles, a horseshoe, flying carpet, etc. You're also going to want to have some high damage weapons. There are several different kinds out there. My personal favorite is the boomstick. It's a bit slow, and it has some accuracy issues at long range, but it's just about the highest damage weapon you can get pre-hard mode, and it's got decent knockback to keep enemies within its effective range. Water Bolt is another important weapon to have, as it bounces several times and pierces infinitely. The damage output of a single shot is low, but when you get enemies or bosses in a confined space, three to four shots can seriously dish out some hurt. Accessories are also going to play an important role in keeping you alive. As soon as possible, I recommend starting a goblin invasion so that you can acquire the Goblin Tinkerer NPC. He'll let you reforge your accessories, to give an additional 4 deep fence per accessory slot with the warding prefix. There are a couple of good survival accessories out there to have, too. Most notably the Worm Scarf and IMHO. The Royal Gel is a good one, too, because slimes are everywhere. One of the most critical pieces of gear to get is a good pickaxe, and you won't find a better pickaxe pre-hard mode than the Reaver Shark. It's relatively easy to get, just go to an ocean and fish with a few worms. It will take a couple of tries, but it's worth it, as the Reaver Shark can mine even the tough crimson or corruption blocks that you would otherwise need to use life-threatening explosives to remove for summoning their respective bosses. The real MVP of any gear loadout, though, is a hook. These serve a huge number of purposes, allowing significant mobility improvements while caving, keeping you safe from traps, and also working effectively as a fall stopper. The easiest place to get a fantastic hook is by killing King Slime. Slime King is one of the easiest bosses to both summon and defeat in the game, so he's a great first boss to focus on. There are also a couple of great tricks to beating him. If you've already acquired the Boomstick and or the Water Bolt, all you need to do is build a platform that's 25 blocks off the ground. The highest Slime King can jump is 17 blocks. Just make sure the platform is small enough that he can't teleport to it, and you can destroy him without worry. But he's so big that you can't help but hit him with your Boomstick almost every time. You'll notice I got knocked off the platform there, and that's uh, that's dangerous. But if you've got your rope ladder set up, and you've got your if you've got your flying carpet, you should be okay. a lot of ammo on this. Don't worry about that. Ammo's cheap. You'll be making so much more money for this. Now one thing that might work is because the Slime King also drops 
a decent set of armor sometimes. If you're fighting him multiple times, you could get yourself the entire ninja set. I'm pretty sure I need to beat King Slime before Daybreak, so I'm just going to go ahead and kick his butt here. And then I'll go ahead and lower myself down here. These guys can't get to me. That about wraps up the tutorial for this video. If you've been following the timestamps in the description, please feel free to go back and watch the rest of the playthrough. Thanks for watching, and remember to like, comment, subscribe, and all that other YouTube stuff. We'll see you in the next one. I don't need mud bricks, please. I need that treasure bag, though. Alright, there it is. We have King Slime's treasure bag. That is excellent. We also ended up with three goodie bags and some pink gel from that event. So I'm just giving myself a pat on the back here. That was a pretty great run. And now I'm going to go to the merchant here and sell some garbage. So I don't need these extra blue slime banners. They're fun to have around. Maybe I'll keep them just for the sake of having them as a badge of honor. I don't need this extra anglet, that's for sure. And I don't need that squirrel. And I think that's probably about all I really want to discard directly at this point. Okay, we don't need that extra stack of rope either. That's kind of silly to have that much. As a matter of fact, depending on what's in this bag, I may be selling those because I may have a hook. So first of all, though, before I start getting into selling anything, I'm going to go out here, make sure I've collected all of the goodies that my friends have dropped for me, collect up all my pumpkins, collect my slime trophy, 